because there's power that's attached to increasing in the favor of God. Amen. See, increase is the will of God for us. Amen. Now, increase is not going to just happen. Amen. <clears throat> but increase will happen as we participate. Amen. As we do what we should do as Christians or as believers. I believe that when we do, then increase is inevitable. Hallelujah. So I, I uh, what I did was I um, presented three questions to you on last week to just set up where we were going and, and how this was going to unfold. And I said, the first question, rather, I said to you was, how different would your life be if you believed that you were surrounded all day, every day, by the favor of God? How different would your life be if, if it was a belief of yours that you were surrounded by the favor of God. In other words, the favor of God to you was like a shield. Amen. All day, every day, that God's favor will surround you or is surrounding you. Second question. How different would things be in your life if doors open for you and you walk through each and every door all because of the favor of God. Doors meaning opportunities. Divine appointments. Where you believe that these are opportunities or appointments that were set up by God. The third question. How different <clears throat> would your action and even your ability, I mean, your attitude rather, be in situations you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that your outcome was victory or your outcome was favorable, all because of the favor of God. No matter what situation you found yourself in, but you believe without a shadow of a doubt that your outcome was favorable, was victory. You believe that whatever the situation may be, however it may be, you win. All because of the favor of God. And so with those questions is, is what really led me to talking about increasing in the favor of God. So what is favor? What is the favor of God? I encourage you on last week, uh, in particular the Amplified Translation, that when you read uh, the word grace, that in the Amplified Translation, it translates the word grace as favor. And if you will learn to read, when you read those verses or whatever, what have you, that you can see a different light in the scripture. So what is favor? Favor is preferential treatment. I said it's preferential treatment. Amen. Even from those who don't understand why they treating you this way. <laughs> hey, <laughs> it is, the, it is uh, the approval or liking, likening. It is to bestow an act of kindness beyond what is due, what is due or usual. This is a time when God goes over and above. Amen. Extending his kindness or kind acts to you and I. Now, I understand that sometimes, you know, we, we, we see, we talk about God, we talk about what the word says, and a lot of times we tend to view it as, well, why would God do that for one person and won't do it for another one? Well, <clears throat> that's quite simple. One person is participating and the other person is not doing anything. And a lot of times it's because, it, I grant it, a lot of times it's because a lack of knowledge. Just like I asked 
earlier, how many of you, you know, believe that God wants us to increase? Well, some of you raised your hand and some of you didn't. Well, I just choose to believe those who didn't, they don't quite understand the impact of God's favor on your life. See, first of all, first and foremost, you have the favor of God. The Bible says, for by grace or by faith, I'm excuse me, by grace rather, through faith, amen. So grace, translate that word grace, for by favor are you saved. It was God's favor that saved you. Hallelujah. And even in that, you had to participate. Amen. Even in that, you had to participate. But now what I'm talking about is now purposely moving beyond that place of salvation of receiving grace to where you can experience the favor of God in other areas of your life. To where you, listen, I talked about three words, to where there is a, an awareness of the increase of God on your life. The second uh, word that I talked to you about was where you have confidence in the increase of God. And the third is where there is an expectation. Amen. See, if we can become consciously aware, and it's possible, listen, you and I can become consciously aware, but it's not going to just happen. But it's through our profession or through our confession of the word. I'm surrounded by the favor of God. There is not anything that I get into or anything that comes upon my life that the favor of God can't get me out of it. So I'm conscious of that. Now, with that uh, increase or uh, a favor is thinking uh, that the, the favor of God where you have confidence. You, you don't doubt. You don't talk doubt. You don't talk unbelief when it comes to the favor of God. Because you have confidence. Now, another word for confidence is boldness. And for those who don't understand biblical boldness or biblical confidence, they would call you arrogant. Some even would say, well, who do you think you are? No, it's just I have confidence in the favor of God. Amen. And it comes out in boldness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then there is an expectation. I expect the favor of God to show up in my life. I expect it. Now, I can't call it like it's going to happen now, but I know it's coming. Amen. If I would continue to hold fast and stay conscious of the fact that the favor of God is available to me. Hallelujah. That the favor of God will get me out of this. I'm coming out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so those are three things that I, I believe that God wants us to want rather to stay in the forefront of our thinking when it comes to the favor of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So <clears throat> I want you to see how we can. How we can have awareness of God's favor, confidence in God's favor and develop and even rather develop an expectation in God's favor. So I, I talked to you on last week about positioning ourselves to receive. See, in order for us to receive, we have to be in position to receive. Amen. See, you don't just be going along one day, you know, just minding your own business and all of a sudden, whatever it is that God's trying to get to you, just come on. come. On. No, listen. We have to be in position. To receive. Amen. So how do we position ourselves for increase of the favor of God in our lives? And so I started out talking to you about making our way lined up with God's word. Making our behavior lined up with God's word. One of the scriptures, and we're not going to turn to it, that I mentioned to you that says that everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been given to us. Now, what we got to do is we got to take those things that have been made available to us and simply choose, amen, to act upon them, amen, with the intent of pleasing God. 
Amen. So everything, listen, that goes into a life of pleasing God has been given to us. If you want to please God, listen, if you want to please God, if you want to live for God, you can. Yeah, there's going to be some hiccups. There are going to be some things that you will find yourself doing that, you know, that you 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 convicted for. Well, just repent. Don't don't sit there and salivate. Don't sit there and just beat up on yourself. Repent. Get up and go back at it again. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, so today I'm going to fast forward because I had some things that I said on last week that I wanted to. Mention that will bring us up to speed, but I'm going to fast forward for the sake of time. And I want to talk to you about another area. If we are going to receive or rather increase in the favor of God. If you want increased favor in your life, start with purposing to be obedient to God in every area of your life. Now, now, immediately, I knew, listen, when I wrote this, here's the thing. Here's what I heard before I even got here. In every area of life, but notice I said, we, you're going to have to purpose. That's going to have to be your intent. That's going to have to stay with you. I want to please God. I would rather, I want to be obedient to God in every area of my life. Now, I had you to turn to 1 Peter. Let's go there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 14. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 14. And I want to read this one, this rather, from the Amplified Translation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 14. Live as children of of obedient to God. Do not conform yourself to the evil desires that governs you in your governed rather you in your formal ignorance when you did not know the requirements of the gospel. Now notice he said when you did not know the requirements go back when you did not know the requirements of the gospel. You didn't know. Okay, but now you know. Or uh, you're in that position of knowing. But notice it said, live as children of obedience to God. Now, why would the word tell us to live as children um, of obedience to God if we could not live as children of obedience? See, obedience has to become a lifestyle or a way of life for us. See, that's one of the reasons why folks are living crazy like they're living. One is because they don't know the requirements of the gospel. So here we are told to live as children of obedience. And I want you to see if I'm able to finish, but I want you to see why obedience is so important. Why obedience is important. So now what is obedience? Obedience is compliance with or to an order, a request, a law, or submission to another, watch this, authority. Compliance with or to an order or a command. Compliance to. Why is obedience pleasing to God? Because, number one, it proves we really love him. It's proof. It's proof positive that we really genuinely love him. See, I would much rather for a person to show me they love me than to tell me they love me. <laughs> Amen. You, you're going to have time to, to tell me, but right now I just need you to show me. And so the scripture says, we're not going to turn that. Here's what the scripture says in um, John chapter 14, verse 15 from the Amplified Translation. Jesus said, if you really love me, you would keep or obey my command. If you really love me, you would keep or obey 
my commandments. Hallelujah. You know, one of the things that is quite obvious to me, a lot of times, you know, it's not that we don't know what it is we need to obey. We, have, we just need to find the courage to obey it. See, a lot of things in this world, if we're not careful, a lot of things in this world will keep us from really obeying God like we really should. Amen. Ignorance being one of them, just really not knowing. We don't know the requirements. And yet, if we spend time in the word, the word of God will tell us things that we should obey. Now, you know, you know me around here. I'm always telling you that you can choose to disobey God. That's your choice. Amen. Listen, you, that's your will. You, choose, you can choose it. But you cannot choose the consequences. And there are consequences that comes with being disobedient. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, listen, we got to learn how to live as children of obedience to God. Hallelujah. So number one is it proves that we really love God or we really love Jesus. Another thing it does is <clears throat> it's an act of obedience with proof positive of our faith and of our trust in God. I said it is proof positive of our faith and our trust in God. See, I'm not talking about just saying, oh, I trust God. Oh, I have faith in God. No, but I'm talking about where we do things, amen, with our faith and trust in mind that that's, what I, that's the reason why I do what I do. Because I have faith in God. Because I trust him. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So, in fact, our faith and trust are the two things God admires most that he passionately responds to. And they both stems from obedience, faith, and trust. Hallelujah. Obedience is doing anything God commands you to do regardless of the cost. See, here's the thing. A lot of times we don't mind being obedient to God, but what's the cause? What, what's, tell me what the cost is. Or if it's easy, I'll do it. Or if it doesn't cost me anything, I'll do it. No, listen. Obedience is doing anything God commands you to do, regardless of the cost. <laughs> obedience, our obedience guarantees us that God will always respond in favor to us. Our obedience will always, it guarantees us that God will respond. In favor. Promotion always follows obedience. Our obedience to God instructions is the only proof positive of our love for him. Our obedience is rewarded with supernatural provisions and protection from God. See, a lot of times when now listen, you got to hear me. See, a lot of times, you know, I believe, you know, in divine protection. I, I believe that the angels of God are encamped around about me. I believe that. But what happens if the spirit of God moves upon our hearts to do something and yet we fail to obey? So I, when I say obedient, I'm talking about the written word of God. I'm talking about the spoken word of God and yea, even the revealed word of God. I'm talking about obedience. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Our obedience to the word of God creates increased favor in our lives. Our provisions are only guaranteed at the point of our Obedience.
our obedience is important. Now, one of the things that I do need to talk to you about before we close today, I want to show you someone that, <laughs> that operated in disobedience. And I want you to see how it cost him to walk in that disobedience. Now, had he known the outcome, would he have done it? Or would he have been obedient to what was told him? He probably would have. I don't know. Let's look, if you will, at 1 Samuel chapter 15. How many of you ever heard the saying, Obedience is better than sacrifice. Let me add something else to that. Partial disobedience is disobedient. <laughs> I said partial. Disobedient is disobedient. And what happens a lot of times, we point to that part that we was obedient to. But what God is pointing to is the part that we was not obedient to. Partial disobedience is disobedience. Hallelujah. Glory to God. First Samuel. Chapter 15. Let's look at verse one from the. Yeah. <laughs> now you got to follow along with this because I want you to see what happened here and. I want you to see in particular how important our obedience really is. All right. Samuel told Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people. Well, we all know Israel, Samuel, excuse me, Saul was Israel's first king. They cried and cut up and pitched a fit because everybody else had a king and they didn't have a king. So God gave him a king. So here, Samuel was sent to anoint him to be king over Israel. Now listen and take heed the words of the Lord. Next verse. Verse 3. Let me look at verse 3. We got, we got to fast forward through this. Now, listen at what God said. He said, now go and smite the Amalekites and utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare them. But kill both men, women, infants, sucklings, oxen, sheep, camels, and donkeys. Get rid of everything. All right. Verse 7. Verse 7. Saul smote it, smote rather, the Amalekites from Havilar as far as, yeah, yeah, okay, which is east of Egypt. All right, now let's go on. Verse 8. And he took Agad, king of the Amalekites, alive. What did God tell him to do? Told him to get rid of all of them. But look, look at what he did now. And he took Agad, king of the Amalekites, alive, <clears throat> though he utterly destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Verse 9. Saul and the people spared Agath, watch this, and the best of the sheep, oxen, fatlings, lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly, utterly destroy them. But all that was undesirable or worthless, they destroyed utterly. What did God tell Saul to do? Saul to do. Get rid of all of them. Next verse. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret. This is God speaking. I regret that I, that I regret rather the making of Saul king. For he has turned back from following me and have not performed my commands. Have not performed my commands. That's, so dis that's disobedient. Have not performed my command. And Samuel was grieved and angry with Saul as he cried to the Lord all night. When Samuel, watch this, rose early to meet Saul in the morning, 
he was told, Saul, he was told, Saul came to Carmel. And behold, he set up for himself a monument or trophy of his victory and passed on and went down to Gilgath. All right, watch this. And Samuel came to Saul. And Saul said to him, watch this now, the nerves. Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed what the Lord ordered me. You lying. You didn't do what God told you to do. Next verse. And Samuel said, what then meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowering of the oxen which I hear? Next verse. Saul said, they have brought. Now this is called worming your way out of it. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice. Watch this now. To sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we have utterly destroyed. Well, they was worthless. Amen. Next verse. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Hush. Shut up. You're lying. <laughs> stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me tonight. Saul said to him, excuse me, Saul said to him, say on. Next verse. Samuel said, when you were small in your own sight, were you not made the head of the tribe of Israel? That's favor. And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the, Lord, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go utterly, utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Next verse. Why then did you not obey? How come you didn't obey? Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but swooped down upon the plunder and did evil in the Lord's sight? Now, this act of disobedience, notice what he called it. Evil in the Lord's sight. Next verse. Saul said, Sam, Saul said to Samuel, yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Listen. Yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agath, king of um, uh, Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. He's still lying. He ain't let that lie go. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things should be utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgath. Samuel said, has the Lord as great a, a delight in blunt offerings and sacrifices in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than, to, than the fatted, fat rather of the rams. For rebellion, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness. Is, uh, is as idolatry and whatever that word is household goods luck and images because you have rejected the word of the Lord he have also rejected you from being king now I want to fast forward because I want to show you something six reasons why it's better to obey than to sacrifice number one disobedience is an act of rebellion Oh, I didn't know that. Disobedience is as an act of rebellion, an act of resistance, defiance, insubordination. Disobedience is sinful, it's wicked. In fact, he said it's as the sin of witchcraft. Do you realize, listen, disobedience run side by side with witchcraft. Oh, I didn't know that. 
Disobedient is a form of idolatry. Disobedient disrespects God's word. It's showing disrespect for God's word. The word that you know God has said to you, you are showing disrespect to it. Disregard. You are disdaining the word of God. Disobedient is based on, watch this now. This is a good one. Is based on looking good to or before others rather than God. But you see, you got to go home with you. You got to live with you. And at some point or another, the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost is going to visit you. And remind you of what he has said for you to do. Partial obedience is disobedience. I want to close with this. I read an article from um, Charles Stanley. How many of you know Charles? I mean, have seen Charles Stanley? I didn't want to quote him, so what I did was I took the liberty to copy this because I want to read it. Partial obedience is disobedience. When God calls us to do something specific, how we respond, how do we respond? Most of us don't rise, don't raise rather our fists at him and yell, I won't do it. We, we don't have the courage, we don't have the nerve to do that. Instead, we use this struggle with the idea for a while. Sometimes we argue, telling him all the reason why we won't do it. At other times, we began to doubt we heard him. Right. And then deny that we even that he even called us or we could react like Jonah and simply run the other way. However, there is another response that is often so subtle. <laughs> we don't even recognize it as disobedient. Substituting our plans for God. Is a way to appear obedient, yet avoid doing what you don't like. So what is that saying? That's saying that God, you know what God have told you to do. So when you substitute what God told you to do for what the way rather you want to do it. You are substituting what God has said for you to do. That's how Saul responded to the divine commands he didn't, that he's been given. In his eyes, saving a few animals to sacrifice to the Lord seemed like a better idea than God's. Saul's sin seemed obvious to us, but we often are unaware of the way we may make similar substitutions. Maybe God has called you to serve in a particular way, but because you're afraid, because fear has shut you down, because you're afraid, you decide to serve in a lesser challenging area. And yet God, listen, when God is leading us to do something, there's always another step and another step. You just had the first step. And if you're disobedient in the first step, or perhaps you work extra hours on the job so the Lord won't notice you in, in neglecting your family. Sometimes we have to blend our plans with his that we cannot even differentiate between the two. What are you substituting for obedience in your life by offering a better plan? Are you quietly and subtly resisting God's call to live fully committed to him? There's no way. Watch this now. Last sentence. There is no way we can ever improve on his plan for our life. Those who try to alter it leads powerless lives because partial disobedience is disobedient. I pray that you have seen 
disobedient in a light that you've never seen it before in your life. We all have to make adjustments. But God's way is always the best way. The reason why disobedience, another reason why disobedience is so important, people of God, is because everything God do have a purpose attached to it. And if you decide to substitute his purpose for anything less than what's been revealed to you, then you mess up the whole plan that God has planned for your life. Partial disobedience is disobedience. My time is up. Thank you for yours. Shall we be on our feet?